I will do something great. I will be something great. These are the words forever inscribed on the grave marker of Roderick Deshaun Scott. Seconds. Lee with the basketball. Pull up jump shot. Good! Rod Scott has tied it up. Six seconds. Well, he's one of the greatest people you can meet. Heart made of gold. He just wanted the best. And uh, something about Rod I know is everything I would do for him, he would do it back. And uh, I never had to question his loyalty. If I needed something, no matter what time it was, or how hard it would be to get it, he would try his best to make it happen for me. Anything that keeps his legacy alive, keep people thinking about him and keep people keep people safe and keep people, people out of home, I'm, I'm for it. So like I said, the kids that are in school now, the, the kids that are coming up, they don't know who he is. They don't know who he was. Like I said, it was a big movement because he, he had been around so long. He was a great basketball player and he was a known basketball player. But these kids that are coming up now don't know who he is, but that seatbelt law, his jersey being up in the rafters and all that stuff keeps his legacy alive. I tell everyone, anyone, to put a microphone and camera in my face, Rod Scott was a God-gifted young man that had the abundance of talent, mature for his age, and always, always respectful. Never, never heard him say anything negative about him. I think God just needed him a little bit more than we did here. Rod was the type of kid who knew what his plans were at an early age. Uh, I noticed Roderick when his mom and dad would go by the house. And they had one of those little Nerf goals, and Rod would get the basketball and just pick it up. Like most kids would just bounce it. He picked it up and put it in the goal. I told his father, I said, man, that's going to be a special young man right there. He played all the way up. Uh, he started like three and four years old playing um, at the Y, playing outside. Um, practicing with him. He had an older brother that played also, so that kind of, you know, kind of sparked him a love about playing, want to be good because he wanted to be as good as he was. And um, we started at an early age playing baseball, basketball, football, soccer. He was always a really determined child. Um, we knew early that he was going to be an athlete. Um, it was easy explaining to him that you not only had to be an athlete, you had to have your academics in order as well. So he always was really conscientious about that. But I knew when he dominated at, at, his, at his regular age, we always played two years up. He was always the smallest one, but he was probably one of the better ones though. But I, 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 I kind of figured that out at a, a, a early age, yes. Anytime he had a chance to go to the gym, he wanted to be there. Um, I remember five o'clock in the morning, saying, Mom, I want to go to the gym. Saturday mornings, he was at the YMCA. He always put in the work. Um, for as long as I could, could remember, he always wanted to be there working on his craft. He hated to lose. He was a competitor, but he was a great teammate. Guys fall on the floor. He was the first guy to go pick them up. He was definitely going to get his. Uh, no matter how, no matter what the turnout of the game was, you, you know who would like you're going to remember Rod that night. He came in the seventh grade, and he's one of those kids I've, I, they, the coaches raved about before I saw him play. So when I saw him play, I'm like, OK, he can play. And him being a baby, Coach, Coach Taylor likes to bring, along, bring guys along slowly. And what I started doing is on Sunday, we've had Sunday practice. And I, some of the older guys are like, I'll get to practice an hour early. And whoever wants to show up, show up. And that first week that I proposed it to the guys, nobody showed up. And then that next week, Rod came and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Coach, I want to come work out, but you need to talk to my mom. So I had never talked with his mom before, so I went out there and talked with his mom. She said, that's fine. And from then on, he was there every Sunday, an hour before practice. He wanted to work. He wanted to get better. And just so happened, God led Rod to St. Jude, where uh, he played seventh, eighth, ninth grade, uh, tenth grade until the school closed. Uh, seventh and eighth grade, he led our teams in school and helped us with a uh, a conference championship with the private school. Uh, ninth grade, he moved up to, to the varsity. I moved him up from ninth grade because I could just see that skill level, his knowledge and maturity of, of the game. He was coming off the bench, and we had an unfortunate injury to our starting point guard, and Rod started starting, and he never let that spot go. It started uh, off the court. Uh, the young man was so mature for his age. 
nothing seemed to rattle him. The bigger the stage, the better he performed. Uh, I'm the type of coach I like to push buttons, just to say our kid would act, uh, react during adversity. Young man never flinched. Uh, he was really mind-boggling to me, but I just knew that God had already instilled something in Rod that no coach or anyone could really just put in him enough to, to bother him. Everybody know uh, Rod was big shot, so uh, when Rod got to hit those two shots, a lot of people really weren't surprised. They expected him to hit it. He was in ninth grade. It was 12th graders on the team, but everybody was comfortable with Rod having the ball in his hand. The first one went up, everybody, as soon as he left his hand, they knew it was going in. And the first one went up, they came back down, they wanted him to shoot the ball again. Like, everybody wanted him to shoot the ball again. They knew he was going to get it, and they knew it was going in if it left his hand. At school, uh, a lot of times the coaches would, you know, be coming in the gym louder. The kids would always, you know, get there before the coaches would. And I always tell them, hey, even if we're not around, you need to go ahead and proceed with what we, we're going to do, stretch, this, that, and the other. I came to practice one day, we were already loud down and sweat, we had been run. I said, you guys ready? He said, yes, sir. So I asked him one day, he said, well, coach said, Rod already had got practice going with everything that you already had asked us to do. Now you're talking about a guy in the ninth grade a leading 11th and 12th graders. Jackson State was the first college they called him, and that was it. You know, he was saying, I want to go to somebody that really wanted me and show them that I could play. And and they showed interest in me. He was like, that's where I'm going. That was, he was, he was, that was the most happy that I've ever seen him, so. Rod had plans to continue playing basketball after high school at Jacksonville State University. All of that suddenly changed on March 3rd, 2016. He had called me, you know, that night asked me, can he, you know, and I told him, yeah, I said, just make sure uh, y'all leave early in the morning and, um, you know, be careful. So we knew that he was going to Birmingham. Um, the next morning uh, when I think it was maybe 10 o'clock, a little bit after 10, I got the call from his dad that he had been in an accident. My first reaction was, surely it's a fender bender, you know, a fender bender, or I never expected it to be what it was. So the first car, I just ignored it because, you know, I thought it maybe was a mistake. Then I got another car and I still didn't answer because I was getting ready for the test. And so when another car came, I knew I had to answer. And, uh, it was actually one of my friends who I played AAU ball with, and uh, he told me, he was like, Rod well, just got in a bad car accident. The car flipped around two or three times. Only thing you can do is pray. I just was put in a different state of mind and um, just nervous and because I don't know what's, what's up, what's happening. Uh, one coach called me from Jeff, uh, from Jeff Davis because that's who they was going to see, and they saw the accident and everything. And he was calling me and try to, you know, try to give me play by play what was going on. Once I got there, you know, nobody really knows what's going on. So everything's running through your mind. Everything's running through your mind. And I, I mean, it took me back to thinking about if St. Jude hadn't closed, we would have been playing. We had lost in Lee. I was coaching at Lee and we had lost in overtime the week before. If we had won that game, Carver had lost on a buzzer beater against Monster Shows. Like everything just replaying in my mind, like I shouldn't be here. You know, if this had to happen this way, but that's just how life is. You know, during the summer, we would always travel to play days. And Rod was a safety fanatic, believe it or not. He would sit behind me and tell me if I was going too slow, if I was going too fast, if the coach was going the wrong way. Rod was the type of guy, he'd watch the speed limit, he would make sure that we were where we were supposed to be at the right time. It, it was mind boggling to me, but just to have that happen and for him to be in critical condition like that, I couldn't believe it because he was always a safety first, do the right thing first type of guy. It was like, it's right. So I I kind of felt like we were immortal kind of because, you know, we weren't bad kids, very respectful. So I didn't think that, you know, Rod would be actually hurt. 
I remember like yesterday going to Baptist South and getting the news of the shape that he was in. something I'll never forget. It's just a day I'll never forget. You know, as a coach, you always try to be strong and, and not show you emotions. And at that time, I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't hold it. Because if I could change anything in this world, if I had the power to, I would be one day in the event that I could. It was, it was a, it was a, it was a bad day for me. Rod was tragically killed when the vehicle he was in hydroplaned and left the road. He was sitting in the back seat and ejected from the vehicle. Rod was airlifted to Baptist Medical Center South where he died the next day from his injuries. When Rod transitioned from St. Jude to Lee High School, he created a special bond with another superstar athlete. It was kind. Of, it was amazing that um, when he got here, how comfortable he was and how he fit. Um, I was nervous about him moving, you know, to public, back to public school, but he got here and he did fine. And then he became friends with Henry and they had a really strong bond. They were so much alike in, as far as mannerism and their personalities. When he came here, then he met up with Henry, which I think that might have had a lot to do with him wanting to come here, you know, because um, when Henry finally uh, came here, which he, they had already been talking. And uh, once he finally came here, I think he, he accepted Lee a lot more then. Rod introduced me to Henry. Like I said, when I first started coming over here, it would be me and Rod working out. I didn't know any of the guys. So Rod was in, introducing me to him individually. And then when we were working out one day, Rod was like, coach, I got, you know, can, can some other guys come work out? And, and popped, it, popped in Henry. So shook his hand, worked out, jumped him into the workout. And you know, the rest was history. So they had already started developing that bond and spending all that time together at school, in the workouts, on the floor. Then they start developing a relationship off the floor. Yeah, I, I'm filled with excitement every time I see Henry make a good play, every time I see a touchdown from Henry, because I know uh, he is sincere. Every time he hold up a three, he really means it. You know, it's a lot of people who uh, really didn't know Rod, you know, but Henry really knew Rod and he's really doing it for Rod. And I remember like Rod telling me, I, I want Henry to go to Alabama, like, you know, I want him to play football. I know he gonna make it in football. I'm really appreciative to him. Um, I know, you know, he has a hard time still adjusting to Roderick being gone. Um, but I'm very appreciative to him honoring Roderick and never forgetting him. Even though I'm not an Alabama fan, that's just one person that I want the best for. Like, no matter what, I just, I just want the best for him. Ruggs and Scott were inseparable. If not for Rod, Henry may have never stepped foot on a football field. The importance of wearing a seatbelt goes much further than just abiding by a law. It's a responsibility that everyone who gets in a vehicle should take seriously a life-saving decision. One of the biggest causes, the biggest cause really, of teen deaths in the United States is riding with another teen. It's being in the car uh, when something bad happens. And so what we tell all drivers is take that responsibility seriously at all times. Well, there's a right way to do everything. There's rules and regulations and things. You know, you pay the speed limit. So you make sure that everyone is buckled up one, uh, that if there's a situation where you have to exceed the speed limit, then maybe you should go. My daughters are seven years old. They were only four years old when he passed, but they, they knew who he was because we had a close relationship. I was around him all the time. And there's not a moment that goes by if I'm not thinking about him. Like if we drive by his grave site, my daughters would be like, Dad, can we stop by and can we go see Rod? The bracelet said everybody where I would do something great, be something great. My daughters wear those to school every day and it's a constant reminder 
of holding on to the ones that you love. And it also comes to a reminder of take care of yourself, control what you can control. Like getting in the car, you, I, I, do, I do it. I, I used to do it all the time, but I, subconsciously when I get in the car, that's the first thing that I grab for. From our perspective at the Department of Transportation, when we talk about teen safety uh, behind the wheel or on the road, uh, it starts with the driver. And we tell drivers, teen drivers, uh, take that responsibility seriously. Uh, if you're a teen driver, know how the graduated driver's license law affects you uh, and follow that because that is not only for your own safety, but for the safety of others who might be in the car with you. In some cases, who shouldn't even be in the car with you as a young teen driver. Uh, so we, we focus on that first. Uh, beyond that, taking that, that driving responsibility very seriously, seatbelt use is the single most important thing you can do as any passenger in any seat in a vehicle. Uh, always buckle up every seat, every trip. Uh, that, that is the, the difference maker when it comes to being in a vehicle when something bad happens. Put your seatbelt on. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Just put, use your seatbelt, you know. Um, I'm a living example of losing somebody that you love, so, so please use your seatbelt, yeah. Although nothing will ever be able to replace Rod, he will forever live on through a law passed by the Alabama legislature. We tried unsuccessfully three years in a row to get this piece of legislation passed to, to make it a law to wear the seatbelt in the rear seat. Uh, we got close uh, one of those years. Uh, unfortunately, it, it takes something tragic sometimes to get it over the finish line. And what we saw was that when uh, members of the uh, legislature, specifically the, the sponsor, Senator Quentin Ross, in that first year, and then Senator David Burkett uh, and other members of the Montgomery delegation uh, moving forward in the year we finally got passage, uh, they were moved by what happened and they wanted to add Rod's name to the law and make it the Roderick Deshaun Scott uh, Seatbelt Safety Act. And uh, really when you put a face on the tragedy, uh, when you put a face on the, on the effort in the legislature, that, that's what got us over the hurdle. Now we, we look at it, we said we was gonna try to do something to help um, other people so they wouldn't have to go through what we went through. Um, that was the first thing that we thought about because, you know, we always talk about well, why he didn't have it on. And we always tell him, and when I'm with him, he used to have it on. So we didn't know why that day he just didn't have it on. So, but we said, uh, me and Renita said that we'll get together and try to do something. And that's what we tried to do. We've been doing it for the, probably, it was right after his death. You know, we've been, you know, going back and forth to try to get that seatbelt pad for the back seat law. And, um, you know, we just finally, you know, that finally came to term. So, you know, that was something that big that we can use to help other other families and other other dads and mothers and cousins and brothers and everybody else that can help, you know, that help them out. The idea of mandating rear seat safety belt use has been around in Alabama really since the early 90s when passage of the front seat law uh, happened. Uh, ALDOT, the Department of Transportation, really became interested in pursuing passage of a rear seat law in 2016. So for the first time, uh, that piece of legislation saw uh, introduction in the 2016 legislative session. Uh, we couldn't get it over the finish line. Uh, unfortunately, that's the same year Rod Scott was killed in, in a, a, a crash. and. Uh, Unfortunately, sometimes it takes a personal connection with members of the legislature to really see the need to take action. And so we were able to get it on track then toward passage finally in 2019. Just to know that with his name being on that law, that if it just saves one life, it, his life wasn't in vain. Um, the way the kids still remember him and honoring him. I pray that the seatbelt bill really encourages them to be safe and buckle up whenever they're in a car. I will do something great. I will be something great. 
These words will forever live on as Rod Scott's legacy. He was a selfless kid. He, he loved real hard. Um, he loved his peers. He loved his family. He was just a good kid. All his life, ever since he was one year old, uh, Rod was always, to me, a special young man. Uh, his parents did an outstanding job with him. A God-fearing young man. Loved athletics. Whatever he committed to, he was in it 100%. He was just a great kid on and off the floor. He was academics. He was just, I mean, he was a wonder to coach. And he's one of those guys that that you want, I want my son one day to, to, to mirror him, mirror his movements, mirror his work ethic on and off the floor. I mean, he was just a joy to coach. Like I said, he never, he always gave you everything that he had. He never, never quit on anything. He wouldn't let his teammates. He demanded that everybody raise their level and he raised his level first. So you couldn't do anything but follow suit. And he still, we look at it like it's keeping it alive. And uh, we talked about it and uh, just keeping him alive, keeping it, his word alive, you know. I'll do something great, I'll be something great. Uh, you know, the boys say it every time they, you know, say their prayer. Uh, the girls say it every time they say their prayer. So that's something that, um, you know, this is unbelievable the way things happen. Roderick always said that he would be something great. Um, and just the way that people remembered him and the way they honor him. It just makes me proud that he was a great young man that he said he would be. Side looks, Haley's got it. Haley to the right side, to the corner. It's gonna be Mashinsky down to four seconds. The Jones floater up, won't go. The tap won't go. And that's gonna be it. That is the ball game. The Generals have won the state title, 40 to 38. Coach, there's a documentary coming out next week on Rod Sky. Talk about what he meant to you and the players and the program. Uh, Rod, Rod means a lot to the uh, program. Uh, Actually, he was on the first team that ever coached to make the Final Four. So that's why right now it's like, um, to me, I'm like, um, no one for because I just remember sitting here with him, my first appearance, here, and I still got that memory in my mind now, and I, and I can't stop thinking about uh, Rod as well as uh, Shaquille, because they both was on that first team that came to the Final Four. And these guys, after all those years, these guys still hold them in their heart, dear and close to them.